Howdy. Welcome to Undersampled Radio, the show where we talk science, tech, oil, business, politics, and more. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Graham. Together, we're the hosts of this circus. To follow the conversation, make suggestions, or rant and rave, please visit the forum Software Underground at swung.rocks. Sampled radio. It's been a while since I've said that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not getting any younger. I have an idea. <laughs> Matt, Matt and I have been talking about um, refactoring the show a bit to be focused sort of on themes or techniques or tools or methods or something rather than focused on personalities, though personalities are probably still our primary motivation. I think it would be, I think it's gonna be interesting to try making the episode specific to a thing. Yeah, that's, that's interesting that we had a focus before. I hadn't realized that at the time while it was happening. <laughs> but now that you say that in retrospect, it's, it's clear that we were, we were very focused <laughs> on, uh, on, what was it? <laughs> personalities. <laughs> No, I, you know, I mean, the thing is, there's a bit of operational overhead, isn't there, to like yeah. arranging, essentially just converging with one or two other people simultaneously. Oh, how anything gets done in the, in the world out there, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, so I, I don't know how this is going to go, but I don't want to uh, change the, the influence that we've or not just the influence of other people on the show but like the whole the whole drive of the show i think so far for us has been to interact with people that we find interesting i don't want to change that i just want to have even if it even if actually the result is no different than what we've done before i think just for me and maybe for you too matt to have like a have an idea in mind about being a better interviewer, to have a topic to focus our thoughts during an episode, like which will it. absolutely go off the rails and that's fine too. <laughs> okay, but something to, um, yeah, something to sort of hang a conversation around. For instance? That, that's, how, that's how the better ones went a anyway, right? It's just that maybe we didn't, it was more of an accident when it went really well. And we didn't really know how to engineer it. I, I'm down with the plan. Okay. Another thing that we should try not to do during episodes is sit in extremely squeaky chairs. I'm just going to try to be very still in this closet I'm in. Uh, I see you have some egg carton behind you. That's yes. An innovation. Let's see here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I guess now that as also lot audience, we're using a completely new tech stack now. So this is going to be hilarious. Uh, I'm sitting inside of a call room at the new Expiro office. And um, it is extremely echoey. And we need to get more of the eggshell things you see on the background for this room. Five other call rooms we have in here. Well, it's an interesting experiment to do there because I've never been sure if it's the flat surfaces or the corners that give you the bother. Because we're, I'm also in the new space because the co-working space that I uh, theoretically work in, I mean, that's my theoretical location, not that I theoretically work, although it does feel a bit like that sometimes. Um, <laughs> so this is also a completely untreated room and sounds quite echoey. Um, it's a sweater. So I'm wondering sort of what to do with it. Um, I would say, so we've tried a couple of different things in these rooms and the only thing that's had a great effect is to take one or more of these panels and just literally hold them in the center of the room. Right. But that's <laughs> there's also, there's be... I, didn't, I didn't show you the floor. There's also a shag carpet, an orange <laughs> shag carpet. Just a baby shag, I would call that. Yeah, it's um... not three quarters of an inch. Um, there has to be a Python library for modeling uh, the acoustics of 
of spaces. That's so pretty homework tell, for next time. As you can tell, we're, we're very focused on a theme, on a topic. During this episode. Uh, that's good. Off to a great start. What is the theme? The theme today is data versioning. Hmm. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a punt, isn't it? I think in the uh, in the lingo. I uh, I I don't know. I just picked a random thing that I'm working on that my teams and I are working on. Um, is is that a thing that comes up? At, you know, in a sort of um, is it a frontline thing or more of a back office thing? Is it something that your actual clients ask about, or is it something that you've gradually realised if we're going to do this client work well, we need to get our act together on on the data back end. Interesting that you should ask. So um, the short answer is that indeed it is something that we build for our clients. However, we have noticed over the past two years that the solutions in the data versioning space are becoming so um, easy to use that we can, in many cases, we can use them for our internal tools, which we use to you know, kind of accelerate projects for clients uh, mm -hmm. in a rapid turnaround setting. Um, more preferable to like that doesn't feel like a, I don't know it feels like a big complicated problem like you don't want to have to kind of it would be like building your own software versioning system wouldn't it oh yeah we, we I don't I have no interest in rebuilding a thing that's already been built by the most ingenious companies in the world right um and moreover what I'll say like in a more general setting is that we have found, and probably as you have too, Matt, is like um, operating in a sort of larger company, like working with our larger clients, data versioning is now becoming a standard. Like it needs, it, you need to have it to really build product based on analytics practices. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we do this? What do you want to, I have a list of things that I could talk about. One of which is the Hello World demo from one of these um, software companies that builds data versioning product. Um, let me, I guess, let me start with yeah, a case. Well, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah, I, I feel like let's motivate, the, like why would a person care about data versioning? What's, what's wrong with my CSV file in my, on my C drive or whatever? Ouch. It's just low hanging fruit, man. <laughs> well, it's got underscore December 2019 at the end of the file name. So I feel like I've done that. I mean, that is data versioning, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, so for instance, I think the only thing that needs to be fixed, that needs to be fixed in that scenario you mentioned, so underscore 2019 sitting on your C drive. I think that the only problem there, the only major problem there is that it's sitting in your C drive. Because the only reason you would, the only reason in practice that you would need to deploy a product based on version data is the, is the case in which it's deployed, right? To, to other, other users other than just yourself. And in that case, you probably don't want to use your laptop C drive as the server as the data server. So I will say that though you could conceivably operate an application that way, um, maybe we just take the exact same example and say underscore 2019, except take that CSV file and put it into blob storage on whatever S3 or GCS, you know, somewhere in the cloud that other people or applications can uh, interact with it. Okay, so I can throw it into, I can throw it into onto a shared drive. Yeah, I don't know. does that solve the problem? Yeah, do Dropbox. Do you think that's? Do you think that would work? I think it would work. I mean, it would be hor It would be a horrible implementation, but I think it actually satisfies a lot of the um, key value props of data version. Yeah, but I, I mean, I guess the problem with a sort of flat file like a CSV though is that. Um, if someone else changes it, I don't really know. I don't know who changed it. Yeah. Um, and I can't necessarily recover arbitrary versions 
you know, from any point in its life, just I'm dependent on someone else backing something up or whatever. So, I mean, I, I guess I do use Dropbox as a sort of poor man's versioning system because you can revert to previous instances of the file um, and I can see changes and so on. But, I, and I guess there's an API for Dropbox, but I just use it through the client and I sort of use it. In, I, essentially, I only use the version history sort of in case of emergency. It's like, oh, I've, I've messed something up or I don't know what happened here, I'm going back to this old version. But um, I mean, I'm just trying to think, I mean, I guess the whole, the whole thing's a parallel to software versioning, right? It's, it, it, isn't there fundamentally, there's a recognition that if you're gonna build um, analytics applications, so you're gonna use machine learning and AI and stuff, the software's one thing, but the, you know, your models also completely depend on the data. That you gave them so you better know otherwise you bet essentially it's like a new kind of technical debt you're building up isn't it is a dependence on a date a data set that you've got essentially got the same kind of horrible control over that you've got over all of your other files your powerpoint files and your excel files and that stuff that's the risk and why and why do you care about that like what's what who who cares if you if you have if you can't uh, access older versions of the data yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. Um, there's all sorts of things sort of buried in there. I can see like one, one thing though, from a, I mean, I guess the, the first concern is, is risk. So from a regulatory or legal standpoint, a person could challenge you and your model and the business you've built on your model by undermining the data set that it's built on and claiming that it contains something it shouldn't have contained. For instance, is there a risk of that? Yeah, totally. Being in the United States, we are still the wild west of the data landscape as of uh, February 3rd, 2020. Um, and I will suggest that your that use case you point, that value prop rather that you point out is is more applicable in the rest of the world where there are more serious constraints on data privacy. Again, as of today, that will, that is ever. Yeah. Well, privacy is one thing though. The other side of the coin is kind of ownership and your right to data. So, I mean, arguably that's a bigger concern in the U S than it is in a lot of other places. Right. True. The other value prop that I'll mention that is related to what you said here and then tied back to your example is that in the case of an application ingesting data to serve some characteristic like underscore 2019, I want to know, I want sales projections for the year 2020 and I have data version 2019. You could, you could build some process be it data science or machine learning or not, uh, which would utilize the 2019 data to make a 2020 projection. Now, in production, what you might find, and, and that will work, right? Like offline, if you're doing a thing, manually typing in some information, hard-coded, even a real application that only operates on that file, that would work. And that is what has worked it, for is, you know, as long as computing has is, is existed in, until now, modern times. Uh, the thing though is now what we're finding is like, let's roll time forward to 2020. Presumably now you'll have a file that has been altered in some way. Maybe it's, you know, underscore 2019 underscore V2, or, or maybe you've gone as far forward as underscore 2020. And you want to make a recommendation or prediction or forecast for 2021. Let's say you then build manually the same thing and you, and you deploy it so that your users can access the 2021 forecast or whatever we're doing, except that you're getting wrong answers. How do you fix that? So hmm. you could invariably go back and retrain models and deal with the characteristics of like, manually going back through that process. And that is indeed what people have done up until now. 
The point is, if you have fully versioned data sets, you can do that, right? It, your underscore 2019 file still exists in storage. You can go back and retrain a model based on 2019. Or, or right. do process. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like that thought. And I don't know if that, I mean, maybe that fills some regulatory need or something in some industries. But I mean, it always, you know, project, big projects that I've worked on that have a multi-year life. Mm -hmm. Essentially going back and sort of rerunning something from five years ago was sort of an almost impossible proposition. You essentially, you had the PowerPoint from the end of the year with your, whatever, your results, your volumes, you know, in the case of um, uh, natural resources, perhaps. Um, but reproducing that work almost meant going back and doing all that work again. <laughs> like if you've actually, you know, because the, mo the model, now that's partly because those models were never defined programmatically. There were a lot of manual steps in them and so on. But since we're going, you know, one of the things that we'd like to see in this sort of new digital future is like um, iterable models defined in code, things that you can rerun, things that are codified. Um, you're going to need you're going to need version data to go along with that. Um, so let just a, a little bit more realistic example there with with higher velocity data is the classic uh, HFT setting, right? You have hyperconsumed trading uh, application where you're sort of trying to predict future price of securities based on past price and other data sources. So let us let us consider the case where you're retraining a model nightly. And so you have a full stack application running fully in a fully automated context. And you have this, you have your price prediction model running, it retraining every night, serving inferences a million times a day or whatever. Um, if you're finding skew, like on day, you know, day plus one, if you're finding skew in model outputs, you're probably going to want to roll back the changes to that release that was right. that nightly release. And to do that, you can use a version data set, right? You say, I, either you say, let me, let me retrain the model based, like essentially roll back the data version 24 hours, retrain model and redeploy to production. So that's the, that's the one step less cartoony case than we just talked about. Except there's, an, there's also another way to deal with that setting, which is retrain your model every day and then save some past number of days of actual trained models. Right? So like you could version your, your like binary arrays of, of train, you know, trainable parameters version those, and then you don't actually have to even go back through the retraining process. So you just roll back right, to the yeah. last version of the model. And I would claim that those two tasks are equivalent, like those two versioning settings are equivalent. And in fact, that's how I advise folks. What you, so let me, let me just say what I think you just, just said uh, back to you. You're saying if you've got versioned Essentially, if you've got versioned software and you've got versioned data, then you've got versioned models. Uh, no, because I think the three things are distinct. So oh, there's three things. Okay. Yeah. So you can software, you can version the data and you can version the like actual model weights. I, I don't, I mean, some people might cap that as code. I don't, uh, I mean, some people might, no. rather. I don't. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a, I think that there's some utility in defining data separately from trainable parameters saved out. It's like, well, it's a sort of latent representation of both, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like, so um, a couple of other things that occurred to me as uh, sort of in an industrial set. Well, one of them from the point of view of the data owner, I think something that often comes up with data that, that I do, sort of don't like is that there's, it's often very difficult for the users of the data, like the end users who kind of, you know, uh, who really notice the details about it, for them to push bugs essentially, or if you like enhancement requests or uh, the sorts of things that users of software might want to push back to developers 
very hard for data users to push that sort of stuff back to data owners mm -hmm. to sort of say, I, I think there's a problem here. Um, what, what you'd also really like is some lot of like fine scale levers on the data pipeline to be able to say, you know what, I'm just going to shut that off for now because I don't trust that piece of the data. I don't trust that column or I don't trust data that looks like this. I don't want it deleted from the data set. I just want to tell the data owner I think there's a problem and I want to stop ingesting it into my current model. Sounds like, a per sounds like what you need to solve that problem is a virtual data store. Maybe. I think of it more as a pipeline uh, thing. Like, I, like I, yeah. I want to separate the store from what, you know, what comes out of the, <laughs> what comes down the tubes uh, into my application. Um, but yeah. I want there to be a bit of two-way traffic along that. Um, so I, I, it, it, that's what a virtual data store can do for me. Well, it's one of the things it can do. I mean, I think, there are several ways of doing that. And as I think as you're suggesting, like in your ETLs, you could just say like, turn off. I, I don't want to receive both degrees Celsius and degrees Kelvin simultaneously with one or the other. Okay. Right. ETL. What is an ETL? Extract transform load, like uh, pick various things out of the data store. Right. So you can yeah, do it. I guess that's what I want is more granularity in there and that two way conversation with the data store. So a virtual data store essentially like abstracts the actual physical data storage from its um, bare metal effectively. And there, yeah. I don't know all the ways of accomplishing that. There are plenty of companies out there doing this, but um, you can effectively like define a data set, which is built out of whichever features or samples or however you want to slice it. Um, and what, what happens then is you essentially, your, your ETL job essentially then is like load whole data set. And then you get this sort of, again, fully versioned pipeline. So you can imagine if you're in your, and let's like ignore the word ETL, I guess, if you're just using your data pipeline, your processing pipeline to define which data is used, then you don't really want to include that in your data, in the version of data for that release, wouldn't you say? If you don't have to. Yeah. You're going through time, you're versioning your data sets, you roll out a new product that, that uses Celsius instead of Kelvin. You want to not even consider Kelvin in that release. So a virtual data store enables you to do that in code, essentially. Like it basically Kelvin no longer even is in the version of the data. Right. Which is kind of cool. um, the other thing that, that sort of occurs to me is that as a, you know, as, as somebody who's thinking about and would like to explore different sort of business models, I guess, for, for the models that we build, um, it, it, and, and actually this is an absolute necessity inside of a global company, you know, in um, natural resources, there's often a lot of like, you know, country specific rules about what can happen to data. So you need to be able to build models and know exactly which bits of which data are coming in from, you know, so if, you, if you're in um, Russia or Malaysia, uh, somewhere like that, the data cannot leave the country. Um, and by extension, potentially neither can a model that was trained on that data. Um, right. So you need uh, a lot of um, taps, you know, coming, you need to be able to like train different versions of the model that meet different needs, perhaps not from different time versions of data, but different sort of geographical uh, filters, if you like, of the data set. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, yeah, I think also this sort of VDS paradigm kind of accomplishes that um, in situ or whatever, like that's kind of like the purpose of it, but maybe not because if you're feeding your VDS with data from multiple data stores, ne necessarily you already have the different data stores set up. So I don't know that you actually gain anything there. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of tools. Yeah, 
Uh, sorry, I, I was just thinking that, um, just let me get this thought out of my head. It might be a really silly one <laughs> or trivial. Because <laughs> um, it was two actually, but w one is that there's sort of two time components on it to a lot of data sets because you've got time series, but then you've got different versions of that time series. So it's a slightly um, potentially sort of mind bending way to look at the data. Because then I was thinking, well, actually, in a way, a versioning, what we think of as like, you know, version 0.1, version 0.2 and so on, is really just another way of saying, show me the most proximal data. It's just, it's version time. It's a bit like saying, show me yesterday's data or um, but in a time series, or show me the nearest data, which is something we often want to do uh, with spatial data. So in a way, it's just another filter. Like it's just another filter and sort um, on a I mean, decent database. Except that in versioning, you all you necessarily always care about time, and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. time series of data. It's time of no. changes to data, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it is like another. It is a, its own axis essentially. Um, but yeah. So. So I, that's an, maybe a bit of a segue because at first you could look at it and think, oh, well, actually I can solve this problem in my Oracle database by just attaching another, a timestamp essentially um, to all of my data and then I can use it as a SQL query parameter. But that seems like a hack. Um, and it sounds like there are actually some specific tools built with data versioning in mind. Well, not only is it just a hack, it actually doesn't work that way. Because if you, let's say you, you append the timestamps, oh, maybe it is. Because if you, if you do, if you never update records, and if you never delete records, if you only create records with a new timestamp of creation, I suppose that accomplishes the same goal. Yeah, it already sounds awful. <laughs> So, but inevitably, um, no, no one's ever going to miss the opportunity to make a new kind of data store these days. So, um, <laughs> so people have done this, I imagine. Um, and you reeled a few off in the show notes. I'd never heard of any of them. So what are those things? So the one that I was going to start with is, is the VDS um, virtual data store um, that we have been working with recently, which is um, this company Molecula has a, has a VDS product. Um, I mentioned it here and I won't mention it again in the show, but like there, we, d we just did a webinar with them. So if you're interested in learning how their tech works, they had a person with us in a webinar and they go dive into the gory details. It's kind of cool. However, VDSs do not a version to data store make necessarily. Um, there are specific products which do indeed do just that thing. So there are a couple in the show notes. One is Quilt, which is like, I, I believe Quilt is still an AWS only product, uh, but it does uh, full data versioning. There's dat.foundation. I don't know what they're about. I've been picking around on their thing recently and haven't used them yet. So hang on. So, okay. Yeah. So Quilt is not an AWS product. It is just offered through the AWS marketplace. Yeah, I assume that's just where they started, yeah. And it describes itself as a versioned data portal for S3. Yeah. So um, off data. Includes a web client that adds search, documentation, and visualization to your data in S3. Mm -hmm. A Python client for reading, writing, and annotating data and scripts, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it, it says free trial here, so I imagine at some point you start, you start paying for it, um, which is fair enough. But have you used that one, that thing, Quilt? Yeah, just for just for demos. Again, we we try not to. I mean, in, in our own landscape, we try not to choose technologies which are uh, uh, like vendor specific. Um, I see. But uh, obviously, if a client want request something, we'll do it. Um, so right now, we're not necessarily advocating as for Quilt as the best one, but but we have used. Um, it. I I'm guessing a tool like this needs to know, I mean, it must have to know some, especially if they're doing visualization, they're going to have to know something about the data types. Um, so I'm sure it's fine with CSVs and PDFs and whatnot, 
like obviously if you throw segwi files like seismic files or something like that it's not going to have a clue uh, what to do with them but are these things typically like plug inable can you extend them so that they understand your wacky corporate you know or in-house um data formats well many of these tools that i mentioned will handle arbitrary data formats because they don't they like a, a feature of these things is that they always take track of the change to a a piece of data and the difference is on you know like the 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 quantum unit of of data so in the case of a, a SQL database you know you could change one record and it would and that it would version that presumably but if you change the like y file yes maybe it wouldn't change like one sample at you know one time increment but it would give you a whole new versioned blob on s3 yeah because i mean in a way because i mean this is you know to to pick on a common example right this is the, one of the things that people don't like about say jupyter notebooks is that uh, and I don't know if this has changed recently because I keep seeing like tools and add-ons and whatnot. But anyway, in principle, GitHub doesn't know how to diff Jupyter Notebooks, right? It's because they're just JSON files. So the, the diffs make no sense. Um, what you'd really like to know is, oh no, this cell changed. Like yeah. this, you know, this image changed. I don't want to see the base 64 encoding of an image and try to try and figure out what changed. So uh, like that would be the nice thing uh, with the data versioning system that knew about SegWi files is like, oh no, 50 traces changed in the middle of that file or what have you, right? So um, that, like, that's, that's one of the things I really like about say GitHub as a, whatever GitHub is, because like, Git is the versioning system that GitHub sort of plays with, but GitHub is this nice, you know, um, front end for that. What's really cool is it can show you a CSV file. It can render a notebook. It can render GeoJSON. Um, I really like that sort of the visual visualization aspect. So that's definitely one of the features I'd like to see of these sort of systems is that I can easily write a parser or translate or whatever that says, here's how to interpret a change to this type of file. And might as well build a new data store while you're at it. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes, I totally understand. And I, I think it's actually a really interesting idea. I'm kind of, so I, I, I don't think, I mean, there are a couple of companies that have attacked this problem in the time series world, but I, don't, I haven't found an acceptable solution yet. Um, kind of going off on a tangent, but you can imagine, I mean, it's a similar problem one time record may change multiple things across a data set and being able to handle that stuff elegantly is i don't think that's a soft problem no oh my goodness it sounds like a nightmare because yeah well you just think about the dimensionality of a data and subsurface say um or really in probably any substantially tricky problem you know massively high dimensional problems and you ideally really like to know what dimension things changed in you know did this move spatially did you change digits did you change i don't know precision did you change uncertainty did you change the time that it was you know the time stamp of this time series like that's that kind of um if you like high level interpreted information would be really key i think to i don't know maybe not maybe all you need to know is no no this is like this is the latest version <laughs> just yes. use this bit less functional that way but i think you can meet a bunch of different goals like if your goal is to have reproducibility and um like release versioning production release versioning versioning a whole blob satisfies those constraints but it certainly doesn't elegantly satisfy the constraint of exploration and um i don't know investigation into data yeah so, sorry, I was just going to uh, add that the, the, the other thing that I find um, a bit n not user friendly about uh, versioning systems and that's quite, well, it's sort of a bit inconsistently done with software versioning, um, but is basically something that tells you how big of a change was this? Like, did you just basically shred the entire thing and start again or <laughs> like, um, so it would be interesting if there was a data versioning what's the point versioning sort of system. I don't know if that's got a fancy name, but whatever that system is would be kind of cool to translate over. Totally. Mm -hmm.
There's another tool on here that I am not as familiar with, which is GitHub large file system. I mean, Git large file system. I had the wrong name. Um, have you played with it yet? Just, re it's, because, remind me what the issue is. Git won't play with uh, files over 100 meg. Um, I check, but yeah. It will, it, but I think it complains over 50 and it won't do over 100. Got it. If, if, if I'm remembering rightly. Um, but the, 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 in, a, in, in stage, you're supposed to put them in the LFS. Yeah. But I, and do, do you, is, is that something that sort of syncs in a different way to avoid pushing these huge things over the internet or what? I don't know. Um, I, I, I only know that they have recently started claiming that it's a data versioning system. Um, and maybe that's just marketing, but um, at the very least, you can s conceivably see how you could use a system like Git on data on a server to yeah. accomplish the actual versioning part, especially of blobs. I mean, yeah. But do these ver data versioning systems, because one of the elegant things about Git is that it doesn't it doesn't remember all your data every time. It just remembers all the changes, right? I think it's like a journal. Mm -hmm. Am I, I'm, I might be imagining that, but I think that's how it works. So presumably data versioning systems work in a similar sort of way. So it's, it's not like a, <laughs> I mean, I can see why if you're, you know, if you're Amazon, <laughs> you might come up with a different strategy for <laughs> versioning the data. <laughs> this is one of the things I've really noticed recently is, I don't, maybe I'm just over the honeymoon period of the cloud and now I'm fully into the skeptical period, but it's also watching the cloud providers descend on, especially the oil and gas industry, as they have in the last year or so, I detect. I mean, they were around before that, but it was nerdy people who were around. Now it's the salespeople. And there's been several articles in the press recently about how, you know, how terrible it is that Google are helping um, big oil companies but I mean you know yeah of course I'm sure they'll come up with all sorts of clever ways of using the cloud <laughs> selling gigantic amounts of compute and uh, storage like are those the people we want to trust with figure telling us how to do data versioning and and so on well you can build your own system of course yeah. or you could use a system like Pachyderm, which has been our software of choice. Look at this. Desktop one, share. Can you see my screen? Uh, whoa, yeah, I can. Cool. So this is the Pachyderm uh, dashboard. Um, so this is how, you, this is like just a summarial um, overview of what's going on inside of your, inside of your version to data repo. Okay. Uh, this is the is the not free version, right? So Pachyderm itself is open source and this is what you get when you pay for it and some other things. Um, and I just what signed it. What earth am I looking at? Uh, I'm getting there. So what happens here is that I've got running on this laptop. Uh, and also, I guess I should try to explain this in detail because people might be listening to this podcast as a podcast and can't see my screen. Um, so I've got right now, um, a Docker container running the Pachyderm repo orchestrated by Kubernetes just locally using Minikube. And inside of this thing, if I press this, I can say Kube control. Um, what is it? List pods. And you can, whoops. Um, what's that here? Get pods. You can see. The, pod, the actual Kubernetes pods on this machine running this so-called data versioning repo, this Pachyderm repo. So what you're looking at on the dashboard here is each one of these blue hexagons is uh, like a data repository. And each one of these green chevrons is a pipeline, is a processing job. So what happens is that as you add data to, a, and you can see there's commits, there's branches, just like Get as you add changes to a versioned data repo, 
you actually get propagation throughout the dependency chain. So mm -hmm. as I add an image to the images repo, it goes, this, by the way, this is the, I don't know if I already mentioned this, this is the beginner tutorial from Pachyderm. So this is just all, um, everyone can run this. The mm -hmm. uh, website, by the way, is pachyderm.io and they have a link straight to this, to this thing that I'm showing. It's easy to get started. So mm -hmm. um, what I've done here is I, I have a, a data repo called images. Then I have a processing pipeline that just uses Sobol filter or whatever to detect the image, the edges. And the output is dropped into this other repo called edges. And then I've defined another processing pipeline where I'm concatenating all of the images in this data repo into a new repo here called Montage. And if I, I should be able to say this command right here, right? Uh, package will get file Montage should show me I just ran this while we were sitting here. Oh, there's only one image in it now. So let me talk through this, I guess. I, I, what I did was I defined my pipeline and my repos here. I dropped an image of the Statue of Liberty into the images repo. It automatically went through this um, edge detection pipeline and outputted a edge image into the edges repo which is automatically then fed through the montage and then dropped into <laughs> a meaningless montage of one. And in fact, I have a saved version. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, where am I? I've lost my terminal. Here we go. I've dropped a better example in here and we just say open montage. Oh, that's not the right thing. We can just go open montage. Open, yeah. Oh, okay. I have too many windows open. Anyway, you get the point of the story, which is version data, pipelines in the middle, yeah. like links in the dependency chain. Uh, okay, and um, it's storing everything as flat files, all these repos or whatever you want them to be. Like their directories? Um, no, no. So all this stuff is saved inside the container. And so it, you can specify them in any way you wish. Like you could, you could specify them as blobs on S3 bucket. You could specify them as flat files, which I, I have done here. Um, you could specify them as links on a web um, anywhere. Um, and the pipelines, the processing that you're doing, those are defined in, in code. Yeah. So it's just... Um, like, uh, open. Actually, if I just do VS Code, we can see what they look like. So this is, again, this is, this is the, just the hello world example from the web page, but. Oh, okay. They're defined in, oh, okay. Right. So this is some Python code, CV2. You can use whatever you like, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then there are these sort of config files, which specify the, the data repo, uh, characteristics. And then okay. all of this again is what we're looking at for podcast listeners is, is literally just some co regular code in a repo. So you have the ability to version your code in your code in Git and version your data in Pachyderm simultaneously. Right. But I, is like, I guess, because it seems a little bit like, well, you don't need in a way you've got all the code, you've got the pipeline stored as this graph. Um, you, you, you can just sort of change your code, press go and regenerate your, um, the data in the repo, you don't re right? You could, or, but you're saying it's actually going to keep track of, it's going to keep those files and make them all again, or how, how's it working? Do you think it stores the diffs as commits? And so when you add, like if users were interacting or even just like analysts were interacting, you'd build a commit and it would store that diff just like Git does. So you don't have to like duplicate data to do this. I see. But that seems a little bit redundant. I mean, I like I totally want a diff, I guess, or store the diffs or store versions or whatever of the source data, like the raw data. So in the example you just showed, the Statue of Liberty photo, um, but like, there's no point in storing the edge detection and you just regenerate it. Here's the code, right? Um, so I don't know, I like, in a, 
the, the code is the is the product. Mm, unless you, I mean, the code is only half of the basis for the product. The other half is the data. So if you if if your if your product is an edge detection output then it's driven both by the edge detection algorithm and the data that's piped into the edge detection algorithm. And if yes. you want to use a different version of that edge detector, you might need to, in the case of a learning algorithm, for instance, you might need to change the input data set to get the outputs yes. that correspond to operational conditions. And in that case, you would want to use a subset of the data corresponding to a commit, a, per, a particular data commit. Yeah, okay. And it, it sounds like, at least from the language you're using, it's smart enough to realize that, oh no, there's just like, if the dependency changed, then I need to kind of go upstream back through that graph and make sure I capture that diff. But I don't care about the diff on the edge detection image because that just depends on the input data and the code. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that's, that's how it makes sense to do it anyway, I expect they're doing something like that. But that's, it's a nice looking system. It's kind of like a, yeah, it's cool. a tensor board for your data. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. Yeah. Hey, what CCAN you have in the notes here? Well, so I don't know if this is the same breed of animal. Well, no, it, I would say this is not the same breed of animal. Um, but CCAN is a, um, open source software for building a, um, a web application that um, is a data repository. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little, you can think of it a little bit like a sort of open source GitHub type application, but for data. Um, so we, we've got a running implementation of it at dataunderground.org. And several open data efforts use CCAN under the hood to build their applications. Um, so like the, the key sort of, um, you know, unit of currency, if you like, on uh, one of these CCAN apps is the data set. So if you go to dataunderground.org, you'll see there's a data sets um, tab at the top. You can go and have a look at the data sets. There's, uh, we've put 35 in so far. Mm -hmm. um, one of the sort of interesting things is these data sets aren't actually hosted by this app. The, the app is just pointing at data that's on the web. Um, Document. You, yeah, exactly. You can add some metadata, um, but you can also uh, keep track of versions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can, if, if the data set is updated, um, you, now I don't know, like it would be interesting to see if one of these source data sets has changed and if Data Underground actually sort of recognizes that. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it does, but you can certainly add another version of a data set and sort of deprecate an older version. Um, and what's really nice, I'm just looking for, like there's a, a data set called Norwegian Shows. Mm -hmm. This is one of the data sets that was collected by um, uh, Petter Bormann at uh, Conoco Flutes Norway. Uh, that has a CSV file attached to it. The CSV files, are, you know, they're actually, there's like a previewer. You can even, there's like a web API, so you can suck data down from this site with, you know, from within a Python script, and you can like filter and, you know, select rows and stuff like that. Um, awesome, Data Explorer is not working for me right now. I don't know why. Uh, it, there's little maps, so you can see where the database, where the data sets have come from, uh, and you can filter spatially and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we we just been playing playing with it for a little while, but it's quite a nice kind of front end for at least for open data sets. So you could use it in house as well. Um, yeah, very interesting. What's the what are the organizations about? The organizations are basically yeah the owners of the various data sets that have that okay. we've that we've added. So like I say, they're not actually physically hosted in this application. It is just pointing at wherever they reside on the, on the internet. So the orgs aren't um, project authors or anything that it related to the CCAN? No, no, they're just the owners of the data, the source data. Gotcha. Um, but what I quite like here potentially is that, you know, if you sort of, I don't know, tr um, train a model on one of these data sets that you've actually got like a, you know, you can make a link to that data set, to that version of the data set um, in your documentation, go back and like 
get the same data back in principle. Yes, yeah. like I said, you it's, 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 you could link to a versioned data set. I mean, you could host a version data set on a server, like using a pachyderm or something, or a Git LFS, and you could use references to the versions inside of Seedcan, right? Yeah. That's the theory. Maybe run it out. Hey, Matt, what do you feel think? like? It's, it's, you know, definitely, um, you know, if, <laughs> Like when I think about my community anyway, uh, this sort of subsurface scientists, hackers, um, I feel like most people are still just coming to grips with software versioning. It's almost that, like you've got to feel that pain for yourself before you get really motivated by it and start to like buy into doing it systematically. And mm -hmm. I feel like when we're even further sort of behind uh, on, on treating data that way. Um, like, so, so I, like, I guess you've got to feel the pain first. Um, and I don't know where that pain's gonna, where that pain's gonna come from, but if, every time we sit down as a community to try and talk about like making open data sets and things, it's like, well, where are we gonna, where are we gonna put it? And how do people make contributions to it? And what if there's a change? Like, how do you, if you're the owner of a data set and you change it, how do you like propagate that change downstream to all the people that depend on it? Like, it's almost like you need some kind of pub sub model to get notifications when, hey, your model might need to be updated because your source data that you trained on has changed. Um, like none of that. Not the thinking isn't even there. Never mind the software and the technology and the infrastructure. Build it, man. On top of your new data store. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it. You know, what, one thing that I think is quite interesting about that is that if you can do a good job of it then you could have a public model um, you know so you could well you could either publish a data set that other people train models on or you could publish your own models and then um, there's a meaningful reason then for clients to want to subscribe to your stuff mm -hmm. so that they get new changes and updates right Be either because it's time sensitive or because you've committed to adding to the data or you know, uh, QCing it and making sure that it's always as good as it can be. I mean, um, as a as a business proposition, you would like to have people to have a reason to keep coming back to you and and paying you for a higher quality product, right? And I think um, getting good at versioning and good at things like subscriptions and notifications and around data and models, you know, could um, could be really interesting then for more startups and and people to actually maintain their data and make a living out of it Maybe. Totally. what are you reading <laughs> oh yeah well um i'm sort of uh between books at the moment but i did just read a couple of really relevant books that i wanted to mention um they're both about ai and the sort of impact of AI on society. One of them's by, um, uh, I think they're both Booker Prize winners, so they're both great authors, but quite different. Ian McEwan wrote a book called Machines Like Us, sorry, Machines Like Me, um, which is set in a kind of cool, uh, what do they call it, a counterfactual universe, mm -hmm. um, where uh, basically Alan Turing didn't die um at least yeah basically didn't die when did he die i can't remember just well early 50s was it mm -hmm. um but is still alive and the book takes place in the early 80s mm -hmm. so, so so britain is like at the forefront of computer science and ai really took off like decades earlier and um they're living in this sort of what to us now would be a sort of slight future even though when it's was it 40 years ago hey when was the book written? Uh, just came out uh, 2019. Okay, interesting. Yeah, less than a year ago. And the other one is um, by Jeanette Winston, first first Jeanette Winston novel I've read, to my shame. Um, she's obviously a very accomplished author. I really like Amy McEwan, so I've read lots of his books. Um, much more literary, 
if you're into the story of Frankenstein, it's awesome because it, it a lot of the novel takes place um, sort of in the Mary Shelley, uh, Lord Byron universe. Um, but it also partly takes place sort of in the modern era and is about uploading consciousness to computers and um, artificial intelligence and also lots of stuff in there about gender fluidity and non-binary gender. So if, if, that, if that's sort of on your radar as well, as it probably should be um, for 2020, it was a really interesting book to read from that point of view too. So both really good. Oh, sorry, that one's called Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Hmm. Interesting. What about you? Got anything good on the go? I'm reading the new um, uh, machine learning interpretability book by Christoph Molnar. Okay. So I'm kind of I'm kind of halfway through right now. Um, he starts the first half of the book discussing model specific methodologies for interpretability, and he's uh, presumably I think that the, approximately the second half is about model agnostic methods, and um, so far it's it's pretty good. I mean, it's really detailed. I mean, it kind of dives not into the methodologies of the modeling, but actually into the methodologies of interpreting the, in the first half's case, specific implementations of interpretability uh, according to model type. So um, excited to dive in the second half and, and look at some of the more sophisticated methodologies as they relate to the model agnostic methods. So um, yeah, recommended. Is there a lot of code in it? There is no code. There is even, there's hardly any math even. I mean, there's, there's a little bit. Um, there is just enough math to crystallize in your mind how the interpretable parts of each one of the models express themselves in, um, in an intuitive way. Okay. And what is, so what's just as a sort of uh, headline, where do you stand on the sort of relative importance of interpretability? Extremely far in the, we need to figure out what this interpretability business is, what it really means and how to implement it in a scalable way. In fact, <laughs> well, we'll have to do another episode on that, but yeah. Yeah, no, that, that would be a great topic. I'd love to talk about that. Cool. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to try to figure out how to stop recording now without hanging up. <laughs> <laughs> I like it.